Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Yeah, as he just announced, I'll be talking about Kafka security, a little bit of its history, and how you can customize it, as well as what it can do today. First, a little bit about me. I'm a partner and co-founder at OpenCore, which is a, well, tiny consulting company in Germany. We are three people, and we focus exclusively on big data and open source projects. And my personal focus is, well, Kafka and Elasticsearch. Those are my two things, which is also why I'm standing here today. I promise to keep this brief. Since you're here, you probably all know what Kafka does, and I've even seen a Kafka shirt in the audience somewhere. So uh, <laughs> it is a distributed, topic-oriented, partitioned, replicated commit log. So basically what that means is you stick data in on one end and you get it out at, on the other end. The important distinction here being that it's also a publish-subscribe system, so it doesn't actually send you the data, but you need to connect to it and retrieve the data in an active fashion. So Kafka itself is never the active part in any data equation. You always need to connect to it and retrieve your data. And everything else internally, replication and things like that, it takes care of for you and does that without you noticing it much. So where does it fit? in today's data platforms. I've stolen this slide from a Confluent blog post. So of course, Kafka is drawn in the middle of the picture. This is, uh, that's just the way that they see the world. Uh, so at the top, up here, you have all your source systems, whatever those might be, if you're a bank or an automobile vendor or insurance company, that'll be different for each and every one. But they'll, all of them send their data towards Kafka and what happens then is different depending on what you want to do with the data. You can, of course, take it out, do some processing on it, join some streams, create some materialized views, or whatever you need for your specific use case, and then stick the data back into Kafka. You can also do real-time analytics and uh, feed dashboards out of Kafka in real time as the data comes in. But of course, for larger analytics use cases, you'd probably want to stick all your data into HDFS or a more traditional data warehouse in order to get back to it later and do larger processing jobs. But what this means is pretty much all of your data at some point in time is in Kafka, which of course allows the question, what about security? Can we keep it secure in there? Or is that like an open hole in our entire security architecture. Back in the day, pre-09 Kafka, this was sort of the view that was taken towards security. This picture is from a TV show called Burn Notice about a spy who keeps getting into trouble. And I think here he has a, a meeting with a crooked cop or something. And he calls this the ring of trust. You're either in or you're not. And for us IT guys, of course, the wall of fire is a quite a good analogy, because uh, back in the day, if you could get through the firewall to Kafka, you could get data out and in and even delete stuff. So uh, it was a fairly black and white picture of what you could or could not do. But since Kafka was uh, developed a bit further, and I think the, the big turning point here was when Confluent was founded, and they started developing in earnest on the product and putting it out into the market. So a lot of people are using Kafka today and security became more and more important. So there have been a few improvements made over the, day, over the years. The first and biggest step was the implementation of SSL for authentication as well as encryption and Kerberos as an authentication mechanism. And then later on, they also added a Cecil plane mechanism, Cecil Scram, and recently delegation tokens was the youngest addition to the Kafka security family. This is a little bit of a of history of when this was implemented. You can see version 09, that was the biggie. That brought us SSL and Kerberos and authentication as well as authorization in general. So this was the, the huge code drop that actually made security possible at all. And you can also see that those two were developed sort of together back here. The Jira numbers, 
Jira is the, the official Apache bug tracker where things like this are kept track of, are fairly close to each other, and they've actually been documented in the same KIP, which is a Kafka improvement proposal. So any larger or large-ish change, or pretty much anything that changes public-facing behavior of Kafka needs to be designed as a KIP, so sort of documented and discussed before it's actually approved for implementation. And you can see that SSL and Kerberos were put into the same KIP for development, and that both of those landed in 09. Since the Cecil stuff, and I'll explain the abbreviations on the next slide, was already there, it was uh, fairly obvious to put to have additional implementations in place. So the first one that was added was plain, which is just username and password. And then Scram came later on. And as I said, delegation tokens just hit us in 1.1. And you can see delegation tokens, the Jira number is actually fairly small, as well as the KIP number comes before, for example, Cecil Scram as well. So that feature is a bit larger than the others and has been in development for quite some time. And it actually piggybacks on the, uh, on the Cecil and Scram implementation, so that was probably also one of the reasons why it took a bit longer, because they waited on those to be finished. Right, so, abbreviations. Cecil is just a simple authentication and security layer, which is basically an abstraction of different security and authentication mechanisms. So basically, so it's just a wrapper around some authentication method, and we saw plain, plain text and Scram already. JAAS is a way of telling Java how to how to do security. So basically, in your JAAS file, you will tell Java that you want to use Cecil, and then GSS API is sort of the same thing as Cecil. And someone who knows better than me would probably start yelling at me right about now. But for me, it's also just a wrapper around security mechanisms. So if we use Kerberos with uh, Kafka, we'd write a JAAS file, tell it to use Cecil, which then wraps GSS API, which then again wraps Kerberos, which probably has some other mechanism under the hood for authentication again. So all of this is fairly convoluted, you might say. And Scram is the salted challenge and response authentication method, which does away with sending passwords in plain text over the network layer. And we'll have a look at that in more detail on one of the next slides, I think. All right, so what's the authentication options that we have? SSL is a fairly obvious choice. Everybody sort of knows it. You have a central point, which is your root certificate authority, and that signs certificates that you then issue to your users and servers. Up here is a, a server certificate, so you can see that you actually have the server name in here. And down here, a user certificate would not have a, a server name, but rather just my personal name that this was issued to. And the way that this then works is whenever the user connects to a Kafka server in this instance, could be anything else as well. First, the server sends the user his certificate, and the user then checks whether this certificate was issued or signed by a certificate authority that he trusts. If not, then everything fails. The second step is that the, the user's process then checks whether this server name actually matches the server that sent him the certificate, which by default is turned off in Kafka. If you want this feature, then you need to uh, switch the default to turn this on. And at this point, the process can stop, but the only thing that we achieved then is that we authenticated that the server is who we think he is, and we encrypted our communication. For authentication, all the client or the user down here also needs to send his certificate up to the server so that the server can have a look at it and see if this user is someone or is signed by a certificate authority that he trusts. As I said, this is fairly well known throughout the, uh, the industry. Most larger companies run CAs of their own. So this, in theory, should be easy to implement. But walk into a customer's office and tell them that you need five certificates signed by their root CA to set up the server, 
and see what they, how they look at you. Most people actually have trouble with this. Another issue with this is if a certificate gets stolen or lost, then there's no easy way of revoking it. Certificates usually are valid for one to three years, are the, the normal terms that you see. So if someone gets a hold of one of these certificates, then of course you can use it to connect to your cluster. And the normal way of taking care of this would be via certificate revocation lists, which the server process checks. And if the certificate is in there, then it wouldn't be accepted as valid. However, Kafka doesn't do this. There's a, an open JIRA for it. It's been around for a couple of years now, I think, and there hasn't been much activity on it. So uh, I wouldn't hold my breath whether that'll be implemented anytime soon. And if you sign your certificates with a shorter validity, so there's been some discussion around that on the mailing list recently as well. You could say sign a certificate just for one day, but you need to restart every process that, that uses this certificate. So that'll, that would make you restart at least your clients fairly often if you wanted to do this. And there's better options, as we'll see on the next couple of slides. And one last thing about certificates, they always run out at the wrong time. You, sh you should think that you can actually predict fairly well when a certificate runs out, because it's like a fixed date. But for some reason, everybody's always surprised when a certificate expired. And then it's uh, Friday before a long weekend, it's the Christmas party, and your security guy is on parental leave, and it just doesn't work. So, Cecil Plain is pretty much just username and password. You configure it via a JAS file. We, I've put a Kafka server configuration snippet up here. And I took this from the official Kafka documentation. So if you want to read a bit more about this, that's where you can find that as well. And as you can see, the username and password up here, that's how the Kafka brokers talk to each other. So this would be used for inter-broker communication. And then you just stick additional users down here. And when your client connects, he can send those usernames and passwords along, and those would be used for authentication. Of course, it's not really nice to put usernames and passwords in a plain text file like this. So up here, you have the plain login module. You can extend that and customize that to retrieve your passwords from, I don't know, Active Directory or some sort of database somewhere, or use a Hadoop key management server, whatever is used in your environment you can connect to that and do this. However, your password will be sent over the wire in an unencrypted form unless you combine this with transport layer security. So this is a, I wouldn't recommend this for a production environment necessarily. Cecil Scram is, or has been invented to um, pick up on that exact limitation. So this, the main reason here was to avoid sending clear text passwords over the net. So what this does is, and I can't really explain this, I'm sorry, but it sort of sends a random value to the server. The server then responds with a challenge, which only the client who knows the password can generate a valid value for. And that way they sort of figure out that both parties know the password and that it matches without actually transmitting the password over the network. Passwords for this are actually not stored in the JAS file anymore. You can see we only have the, the admin for interbroker communication up here anymore. Um, passwords for this are stored in Zookeeper. So in order to administrate this, you'd need to be able to access Zookeeper and put stuff in there. And what's this also, an additional feature that this has is you can bind it to your transport layer security which means that the information from your certificate is somehow part of the exchange with the server for added security to ensure that you actually are who you say you are. Right, Cecil GSS API. This is the, where the money is, literally, because if you're good at solving Kerberos issues, then you can make a lot of money consulting. So everybody has them and nobody knows how to figure them out. Kerberos can be used, well, actually, as I said, GSS API is also a wrapper around security mechanisms. But it, when I say GSS API today, I mean Kerberos because this is the only implementation that Kafka supports in this way. 
And it can be used to integrate with Active Directory or different directory services. So what that means is your user can, on the command line, type k init with his username. He'll be asked for his password. And that password will then actually be checked in your corporate Active Directory. And if that user has the correct password, then he'll get a ticket back and can use that to access services. There's two different types of principles in, uh, in Kerberos. There's, one, uh, there's the user principle name, which is who I am. So that can be used from pretty much any, any machine. And service principle names are usually bound to a specific server. That's the same deal as with a certificate where the user checks whether the server who sent it is also the one that was issued this certificate. Yes, and as I just said, the initial authentication is via password, which of course does not work if I want this to run as an automated process that can be restarted or come up when the machine comes up. So there's, the, uh, there's also the concept of a key tab, which can be used to retrieve a ticket. And that key tab is pretty much your password in a file. It's a little more complicated than that, but what it boils down to is if someone gets a hold of that file, he is you for all intents and purposes. So protect those files well. And then on the next slide, we can see how Kerberos authentication sort of works. So if I'm a client and I want to access the Kafka server back here, what I do is I contact the key distribution center, which would be Active Directory in the example we just have, and try to get a ticket granting ticket, the TGT for our uh, further speaking. The KDC then checks whether I have a valid key tab or a password and a little bit more, does a reverse DNS lookup and stuff like that. And then I get a ticket back, which is a ticket granting ticket, sorry. In the next step, when I want to access Kafka, I again go to the KDC, but this happens transparently in the background. I don't have to actually do this myself. And with this ticket granting ticket, I ask the KDC for a ticket that allows me, Zemke at opencore.com, to access Kafka Server 1 at opencore.com, which is that guy back here. And with this ticket that I got, I'll actually go to this server who can check the ticket without actually talking to Active Directory. And if all is well, I'm allowed to access the server. So if we now have a larger Kafka cluster, say, I don't know, 100 machines, and I read from a topic that's fairly well distributed across the entire cluster, then, of course, I need to go out and get a ticket for each and every one of those servers. And if it's not just me doing this, but it might be a Spark job that runs distributed over 100 nodes, then there'll be quite a few tickets to be issued. And maybe I, uh, that job retrieves the data and wants to store it into HDFS. So it'll again go to the KDC and grab quite a few tickets for uh, storing the data into HDFS. So if you have larger jobs, um, there can be quite a bit of pressure on your, on your KDC when you run these. So that was one of the main reasons. The other one being for distributed jobs, if you wanted those to run for a long, long time, um, you had to give your key tab to the job and distribute that throughout your cluster, which, as I mentioned, you want to keep your key tab fairly close to your heart so people were not too happy with that. So then Kafka adopted something that was... It was probably not invented in the Hadoop world. I'm fairly sure other systems have it as well. I first came across it in the Hadoop world, so for me it's always been a Hadoop invention. So-called delegation tokens. So those hit in Kafka 1.1, and what those allow us to do is, after we authenticate with a primary authentication me method against Kafka, so SSL, or Kerberos, plain or Scram, pretty much anything works, we can tell Kafka that we'd like to have a delegation token for the user that we currently authenticated as. And then Kafka will pretty much just generate a random value, store that internally, and give that back to me. And what I can then do is I can use this token to authenticate as myself. So if I have, for example, a distributed Spark job, I'll just take that token and hand it out to all the executors, and they'll use that token in their communication with Kafka. And Kafka will say, right, you're Zenke. 
but the jobs never had my KeyTab or needed a certificate or anything else. These tokens, of course, are only valid for Kafka. So if someone steals one of those, he couldn't use those to access HDFS, any database, pretty much nothing else. Also, these tokens are only valid for a limited amount of time. By default, they are valid for a day, and you can renew them for up to seven days. After that, there's no way of renewing these, unless, of course, you change the configuration, as always. Nothing that can't be configured. Um, after those seven days, you need to re-authenticate with a primary method of, of uh, authentication and get a new ticket. So if one of those tokens gets stolen and someone actually manages to use it to retrieve data, seven days is the maximum that he can, can do that for. And of course, unless certificates, or unlike certificates, it's fairly easy to revoke these. You pretty much just tell Kafka to delete that token and because it's stored internally there. Once it's gone, it can't be used for authentication anymore. So the main focus of these things is to be used in long-running distributed jobs, so Spark Streaming. And Spark Streaming actually has internal methods of obtaining these delegation tokens and renewing them for you. It just doesn't have these for Kafka yet. So if someone feels like building that implementation, the entire community would very much appreciate that. Yeah, so this is just the picture that I was supposed to click to. All right, so we have quite a few different authentication methods, and we can happily mix and match those in our Kafka broker configuration. So as you, as you see up here, you can Cecil plane, and then you can also combine that with SSL, Cecil plane. So your broker configuration, you can pretty much have as many ports as you like open with different authentication mechanisms. And you just need to keep track of those in your client configuration to be sure that you always connect to a matching port. In recent versions, I think it was in 0.10.2, yep, actually I put it down here, 0.10.2, um, there was a change in the way that this is configured. It used to be a bit problematic in some network scenarios, especially if uh, netting was involved or you had to go via a proxy to access Kafka, then sometimes there was a bit of an issue because your client always connects to the, the internal IP address of your Kafka brokers. And if that differs from, for example, a NAT server along the way, then sometimes there could be issues. So it, sometimes it actually was not even possible to have that scenario. So in later versions, past 10.2, you can actually distinguish, distinguish between external and internal network traffic, which makes those scenarios much easier to accommodate. Okay, so far we've talked about authentication only. So now the cluster knows who I am when I talk to him. But so far that's only so much we had already before with the firewall. So we could have a black and white scenario, you can read or can't read, or can write or can't write. So in the initial commit that I pointed out earlier, version 0.9, the um, Kafka also gained the ability of having a, of having access control list, ACLs. And the reference architecture for this is the simple ACL authorizer, which stores its ACLs in Zookeeper. And, well, it's ACLs. You can grant, read, write. It's, it's fairly standard. I won't go into too much detail on this. Uh, only thing that's noticeable is you can also have super users. For those, ACLs are not even checked. Those are just granted any request that they make. Those would usually be your Kafka brokers so that within the cluster, those guys can talk to each other freely. What is worth noticing is that all of this is entirely pluggable. So the simple ACL authorizer is just a, an example, so to say, of how this can be ha handled. However, my personal opinion is that it's, it's quite suited for roughly 98% of all use cases. Maybe we can have a quick show of hands. Who uses Kafka? And please keep your hands up. And who has security enabled? And who is not using the simple ACL authorizer? Who is not? Not. So who has a custom authorizer? Okay, that's roughly what I expected, to be honest. 
so yeah, it, it works. Y you can define ACLs, and it, uh, it gives you what's, in the, what's on the box. ACLs uh, are always granted per resource. So you can uh, grant ACLs or rights on topics, on consumer groups, or the entire cluster. There is limited wildcard support as well. So you can have star, which means everything. And there's a few JIRAs that look into having additional wildcard support, support, so to say. So for resources, I think it's close to being able to commit it. So in one of the next versions, we'll probably see wildcards in resource names. And for IP addresses, um, there's a JIRA that wants to introduce um, IP ranges and CIDR annotation which is actually being driven by me. But those guys up here were a bit quicker, and they changed the way that ACLs are stored. So they made my life a bit harder. I can't tell you when that'll come. But at some point, it'll be ready as well. And then you can allow or deny actions. And you have a default if there's no ACL for a resource where the request should be granted or denied. Now I hope, yes, everybody should be able to read that, I think. So this is an example of creating ACLs for Bob and Alice. Bob and Alice want to read and write to the test topic, and Bob and Alice are allowed to connect from these two machines. Again, I've taken this from the official Kafka documentation, so if you want to read a bit more detail about that, feel free to go there and check it out. And as you can see, this has the list of all ACLs that are added. So it actually multiplies out Every, everything that we have up here. A, an ACL is always just for one resource, from one host, and one principal. So we have Bob from machine, zero, read, and this topic. So we should be able to find that somewhere down here. Allow permissions for read from zero, back there. So this one command actually created three, six, eight ACLs in our Zookeeper. And again, if we think back to our couple of hundred nodes cluster, if we want to add those IP addresses to this and then have a couple of more users, it can get to be quite a long list of ACLs that are stuck into Zookeeper here. So now let's say we actually added Alice by, uh, by mistake. So we want to take her out again. So instead of add on the slide before, We'll now put remove, again, have the user Alice, operation read write on this topic, and we remove the, the hosts because we just want to remove Alice. We don't care what host. And what now happens is something that user Alice has allow permissions for write from host star. Those are the ACLs that will be removed. And if you check out the current state after removing, well, Alice still has access because ACLs are always matched exactly and what we try to remove is host star, which didn't match that host, so that ACL still sticks. So what we need to do is actually remove exactly the ACL that we created initially. And if you do that and check down here, then actually four ACLs will be removed, and now only Bob has access anymore. So what this example is supposed to demonstrate is this is not a very intuitive tool. It's, you need to spend some time with it and uh, curse a little before you can actually use it well, I think. All right, so the first line up here is actually something that's quite important to us because we saw we didn't connect to Kafka to administer these ACLs, but we actually connect to our Zookeeper ensemble. So we can only do this from somewhere where we where the firewall allows us to access Zookeeper. And also, we need to be able to write to Zookeeper. So consumers and producers, they don't need Zookeeper at all. Old versions did, but the new versions, they only talk to Kafka. But most of the command line tools, so if you create topics, if you create ACLs, those tools will actually talk to, to Zookeeper directly, which, of course, makes the question interesting, does Zookeeper have security? Because if someone who doesn't have access to Kafka can just go to Zookeeper, create ACLs for him to allow access to Kafka, and then get the data, 
that sort of defeats the entire purpose. So yes, Zookeeper does have security. You can authenticate there with Kerberos as well, which then creates a little issue though, because when Kafka creates nodes in Zookeeper, it'll make those world readable, which is sort of fine, but only writable by itself. So what you need to do is impersonate a Kafka broker if you want to add ACLs, which means SSH into your machine, sudo, grab the key tab that Kafka runs with, issue the command, probably talk to someone from IT security why you did that on a production machine. And it's all not really nice. So there's a new thing, which is called the Java admin client, which does all the same operations without talking to Zookeeper. That actually talks to Kafka itself and requests that come from this client go through ACLs themselves. So you can actually properly authorize people to do things. However, to use that, currently you actually need to write Java code because the command line tools have not yet been migrated over to use that thing. There's a couple of JIRAs for them and it's, I'm sure it's going to happen at some point in time, but not yet. All right, so I'll just to go through this really quickly because I think I'm running out of time. Uh, this is just the entire authorization sequence if a request comes in. If the user comes in, the user is checked. If it's a super user, we allow immediately without doing anything else. If not, we retrieve LCLs for the resource and the request. If we have none, we look at this parameter that we can set in the broker configuration. And if that is true, then we allow the request. If not, we deny. If we have ACLs, then first we check whether anything should be denied. If that's a yes, we deny the request. If that's a no, then we check whether there's an ACL that allows this request. And again, deny or allow based on that. So that's what happens internally when a request is checked against ACLs. I apologize for this. Five minutes before the talk, PowerPoint decided to fuck up my slides. So you'll have to have a little fantasy that the, the arrows actually come from down here and go up here. We looked at authorization methods earlier and we had quite a few. We had plain text, SSL, Scram, GSS API. But in our ACL definition, we can only put something. A, a minute ago, it was user Bob. But where did that Bob come from? For example, Scram is easy. It's just the username. But SSL or GSS API are a bit more involved. So what Kafka does for all these requests, if they come in, it passes those to a principal builder. And that principal builder looks at the authorization context, authentication context, sorry. And based on what method is in there, it'll do a variety of things. And what it will do, I've put into this table. So for plain text, it can't do anything. We don't know anything about the user, so that'll always be anonymous. Same thing for SSL, if the client didn't send a certificate with his request, that's pretty much the same as plain text. For Cecil Plain and Cecil Scram, we actually define usernames, so it's fine to use those. For Kerberos, it'll be, it'll actually by default, I think it'll be the short thing up front here, but you can define auth to local rules, which is sort of like a regular expression that tells Kafka what it should do with your user principal name and how it should extract the username from that. And for SSL, it'll actually take the entire certificate. Right, my pointer died. Anyway. And extract all information that's in there and use that entire string as the username. But again, all of this is pluggable. So if you're not happy with this, write your own class, extend the Kafka principle builder, and you're good to go. Because what Kafka actually does is, yeah, well, anyway. The authenticate request comes to the broker. Then it gives that to the default Kafka principle builder, which the behavior of that we saw in the table earlier. That returns a Kafka principle, which is then passed to the ACL authorizer, which we saw earlier, user Bob or user Ellis. And that then says, you're good to go or no. And the response is passed back to the client. So both of those classes are configurable and extendable. There's, uh, that's actually quite a nice example of consistent parameter naming in open source projects. 
And there's two main um, implementations that are out there, Ranger and Sentry. If you use a Hadoop distribution and your Kafka is part of that, then um, based on whether it's Cloudera or Hortonworks, that's what you'll get and what you can use. But of course, using pre-built stuff is not really fun. So uh, in the last five minutes, we'll look at implementing our own Kafka authorizer. This is fairly brief. I'll just show you a couple of slides with a bit of code and explain what I've done. But I've written a blog post on this as well. So if you want to code along or look at that, please uh, feel free to go there and check that out. So what was missing earlier from, our, um, from the ability to define ACLs was we had no concept of user groups. We always had to authenticate a single user. But large corporations usually use Active Directory and group membership in Active Directory for their rights management. So what we'll try and do is build an authorizer that looks up the user that authenticated himself in Active Directory, retrieves the groups for that user, and then allows us to authenticate, authorize based on those groups. So there's four things that we need to do for that. We need to create a principal builder that retrieves groups from Active Directory which sounds complex, but actually we'll cheat a bit on that, and it's really easy. Then we need to extend the principle a little bit, because the default Kafka principle only has a type and a name, which is fine. We could have used that for a group, but users will probably belong to more than one group, so there it's not sufficient anymore, so we'll just make a list out of that. And then we need to create an authorizer that understands that and enable the user to create and manage ACLs, just like we've done on the command line earlier which again is easier than it sounds. So this is the complex Kafka principle, and now it's actually a bit of a pity that my thing doesn't work anymore. Um, and what this is, is it's just a list or a wrapper around the normal Kafka principle so that we can store a list of principles in a single, single object, which would then be a list of all the group memberships that this user has. And looking up the groups, I actually stole that part from Hadoop because they have something called a group mapping service provider, which is an interface that allows you that you can code against and retrieve groups for users. And this Im specific implementation just checks the local OS user and retrieves groups that that's a member of, which if you use something like SSSD or Centrify to manifest users from Active Directory on your local machine, works quite nicely. And then to match the ACLs, I've taken the simple ACL authorizer and just changed a little bit of code uh, where, where necessary. So this is pretty much just unpacks our list of principles. And then the only really important part is actually these three lines down here, where it checks all the principles that we unpacked from the list against all our ACLs. And uses OR to get those together, and if any single one of those matches, the thing is allowed. And if you put that to the test, you can see in the first example that the user sliber at opencore.com has allow permissions for a topic, but down here, you can see that the group supergroup, which my user is part of, also is allowed to access a different topic so we, in this example, we have authorization based on groups from Active Directory. And what I forgot to mention here is that we can still use the default command line tools just like we did before, because what Kafka does for these principles in ACLs here, it just splits at the colon, and you can stick anything you like before that in your command. And so we just could reuse the entire command line tools. And with that, I think I'm exactly in time. Thank you very much. Thank so you. Good. Are there any questions? Oh, I see I see Lars one. has one. Thank you for a detailed presentation. Um, so I, I used Kafka from back in like 06, 07 days when there was no such thing as security. Okay. And uh, back in that time, that was typical for most big data tools. The security was an afterthought. It's the normal life cycle. Uh, so when my clients ask, you know, how, how do we solve this security thing? Uh, my main answer has been, well, go to the cloud and wrap all your things in 
containers, VMs, something, and use the cloud security mm. paradigms, like whatever access control they provide. Uh, so your strategy is something different, right? Uh, so could you compare pros and cons of these two strategies and help me uh, I would say decide? that this is probably a bit more fine-grained access control, because if you wrap something in a container, that's sort of still access control based on who can actually get to the thing if I didn't misunderstand you. So what that doesn't allow you to do is give someone access to a specific topic or give someone just read access to a topic but not write access to a topic. And you probably need to think about network infrastructure and sort of the overall architecture picture a lot more if you wanted to use that for access control. So this is a bit e easier, I would say, but more powerful. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Thanks.